uh, is going to be able to connect with us. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm okay, back. I'm back, uh, Nick. I'm on. I'm, okay. I'm on it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. I think we're going to start. Oh, there is people in already, and I'm going to just welcome everybody and then hand over to you because I think you you then going to run it for us. But I think we we share the the whole issue of confidentiality and of course non-compliance to competition commission. No problem. I think we also we all so. Um, clued up with the system that there's no more problems anymore. Welcome to everybody. Welcome to our new chairperson, which Anthony will um, introduce. I'm not going to waste your time. I think you, you see me enough and you hear enough of me. So, yeah, thanks for this regional meeting. These things still mean a lot to us because we can communicate in a region and we're going to run them all through South Africa. Anthony, thanks for, for setting it up and getting all the speakers and so forth. As I said, I might duck out because I'll be cut off and I see Barry Pierce has got the same problem, so he might not be able to get in. But I'm handing over to you, Anthony. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. And, and uh, yeah, thanks for, for giving us uh, this platform to, to have this meeting. Um, it, it's a very important part of, of the uh, the uh, of what Aspasa is trying to achieve, and that is obviously the best running operations in the country with health and safety and environmental issues, etc. Um, welcome everybody, and thank you for for taking the time to join us. Yeah, and my name is Anthony Bowen. Uh, I was the I'm the outgoing chairman of of the Mpumalanga Regional Committee, and uh, um, I think it's it's uh, fit for me to. Thank you all for your support over the last couple of years. We've had some interesting times. We've had physical conferences. We've had uh, online conferences. And it's been a very successful platform where we can share information and, you know, just help everybody to, to achieve compliance and to improve the standard of their operations. And, of course, the, the main thing, of course, there is to uh, prevent and not even rectify, but prevent any injuries or fatalities. Uh, just the quick rules of, of the meeting. Uh, please uh, keep your videos off and also mute. It just helps with the bandwidth. Um, if you need to say something, please at the top of the screen there, put your hand up and uh, we will most certainly have a, give you a chance to talk. Uh, we encourage everyone to please, this is interactive, please you know, make use of it. There are specialists on the, on the, on the calls. And, uh, you know, you, it's, this is your meeting. So get as much as you can out of it and, and please feel free to comment. Having said all that, um, as I said, I'm the outgoing chairman. Um, we have uh, appointed a, a very, very competent young man um, from the Pumalanga region. Um, I had the privilege, um, uh, Anthony, if you could just mute and put your video off, please. Anthony, if you can just put your video off and mute as well, please mute. As I was saying, I, I uh, our, our new chairman, a very competent uh, young man who I had the privilege of working with for a number of years. Um, uh, he's a well-qualified health and safety executive, or well, not executive, but uh, certainly manager. Um, somebody who's made a big difference in, in his field and in the area that he's working with. Um, he worked with me at uh, my previous operation where I was at, at Fage in Nelspant. So um, with that said, um, welcome to Mangoba Moyana. And uh, Mang Mangoba, I, uh, I, I know that you will take the, uh, the chairmanship of, of this committee and, and run with it. Uh, you've been part of it. Um, so uh, we wish you all the very best. And uh, uh, I'm going to hand over to you in your new role. So there we go. Thank you, Mangoba. Uh, thank you so much, Anthony. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. As, as Anthony mentioned, my name is Mangoba Moyana. Uh, I'm the health and safety officer here at Nelly Sprague, Quarry, Lafage. Um, so yeah, I'll assume the roles um, and responsibilities of the chairman. 
for the Aspasa Pumalanga region. And um, I hope we will work quite well with everyone, with the support of everyone. And uh, uh, um, and I think everyone will definitely um, learn something uh, from 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 the engagement on these meetings. Uh, we have uh, been attending the meetings, and uh, they were very fruitful. And I, I hope and believe um, they definitely gonna make a difference in the industry. Um, thanks, Anthony, for for the opportunity. I think we can move to the to the next um, item on the agenda. Aniki, can you please um, present the agenda? I'm not sure whether uh, you can hear me clearly on my side. Our network uh, is not quite well. We've just recovered from load shedding. So our signal is not uh, quite well. Uh, we've been struggling for the past 30 minutes or so, uh, but uh, it's much better now. On Google, please advise if you can see. Um, I'm not seeing anything from my, okay, I think it's coming up. There you go, thank you. Can everyone um, see the agenda? Okay, Anik, I hope Anik, everyone Anik, able. Anika, make it a bit bigger, please. Okay. Thanks, Anika. Can I just chip um, in here for a, sorry, Mangaba, I just want to chip in here. Anika, um, the ish feedback, I notice it's not on this uh, on this agenda. The health and safety feedback, which I'm going to give on behalf of Marius. You, you guys there? Yes, um, we are here, Anthony. Okay, well, maybe what I can do, uh, if it's, uh, sorry to chip in here now, but I can I can combine it with, uh, I can do two presentations in one. I've got my slot there for the environmental audits. I can just do Marius's at the same time. Okay, I think that will be perfect. Uh, you just chip in it out after your, your yeah. presentation on environmental audits. Yeah. yeah, so I'll, I'll okay. start off I'll start off with the with the health and safety and then I'll do environmental. It'll it'll just make that slot a little bit longer if, if everyone's happy with that. Um I, I'm just a suggestion. Okay. With that being said, um I think we can uh, move to the next um item. Um I'm not sure whether the Rudolf um are you ready on your side? Um Aniki can you present the DMRE um, presentation? Can sure. you put it up? There, there you go. Can everybody see um, it? Can um, see? Yes, we can see it. Uh, yes. Thank you. No. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, I will be obviously taking you through the presentation that we have prepared. And um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so this is how the presentation, uh, the, or rather this is what the presentation will be covering. We'll be looking at uh, the national stats, uh, stats also for our region also communicating concerns from the mining side of things and also engineering side of things and also we'll be discussing the there is a new directive that um, addresses uh, fire fire issues on conveyor belt 
and we'll be touching on it. And also, there is also two guidelines that were revised on noise and also on um, uh, thermal stress. Um, yeah, can we continue to the next page? Yes, thanks. So, like we always do, um, this year we are sitting at five on uh, nationally, so meaning we've got five fatals compared to eight last year. And we we always say that um, one fatal is, is too much. I mean, uh, but also I believe that where there is progress, we must still celebrate it. And uh, because the three lives that were, I mean, really saved as compared to last year are also worth celebrating. So this is where we are. And you, we can see that the gold sector contributed um, to this year as compared to six. So there is a, um, a serious improvement, uh, the coal sector, uh, the one, and uh, the same time last year it was one. Same with the platinum sector, and there is also one uh, this year as compared to zero from the other sectors. So we can go, go to the next slide. Uh, next slide. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, zooming into our region, or rather the regions actually, um, we are going to basically just look at our region. So as compared to last year, we have not made any improvements as far as our performance from beginning of the year up to now, because we had one last year and we are also sitting uh, on one this, uh, this time this year. So we really have not made any improvements because we had a fatal last uh, month on um, i think it was can't remember exactly the date but it was just the sunday before before the the last sunday of of, of feb um where in a coal mine where uh, obviously because the investigation is um, still is not yet concluded but the the little details that we have is that um, a, an employee was hit with, um, it appears, um, it was hit uh, by a piece of coal that dislodged from the corner pillar underground, and uh, then they succumbed to, to their injuries. So that is the one feature that we 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 are sitting on uh, this year and i think i must also just um, uh, mention uh, uh, and also you know appreciate uh, you know the the queries for for their performance i mean in 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 as far as i can remember i think also in the last five four years we we've not had any major uh, incidents from from the quarries, so I think it's it's worth mentioning that your your really your hard work is noticeable. So we must just continue and, and you know with the same spirit uh, to ensure that we achieve zero harm ultimately. Also in uh, with the issue of injuries to ensure that ultimately we get to a point where we we don't only stress so much about fatals, but so much because there won't be any fatals, but so much about injuries. So, yeah, so um, thank you very much to basically all the quarries in, in our region. You are really, your your effort is is appreciated and acknowledged. So thanks. Let's just move to the next slide. Um, I'm just going to basically mention, I'll say, 
the issues that are keeping us busy from the mining side. Um, our region has actually each year we see an increase in the number of complaints. Um, obviously, due to the the blasting. Um, so I just want to also, you know, emphasize that part that all all the quarries that are very close to communities. Uh, please, we need to make sure that uh, we 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 really put in the the the, the work in terms of ensuring that our fly rock is um, we don't have those uh, fly rock issues where people's houses, people's, you know, uh, livestock or basically the community is protected. And also the ground vibrations and the air blast. Let's try to ensure that we stay below the limits. And uh, in terms of we know most the limits, um, the 135 and also the 12, uh, you know, in terms of um, to, uh, the, the vibration, 12 millimeters uh, per second. And also the issue of noise uh, and dust as well. Uh, you know, dust not only coming from our operations, even where our clients' trucks uh, travel. If there is a community, I mean, uh, then we don't want to expose our communities to uh that's the problems so let's make sure that we put in the, the hard work to ensure that we we, we operate with with no uh, without really creating new problems to the to our communities and also i think what is also important uh, is also having a proper complaints management procedures that will also uh, guide the community in how they you know, need to bring their complaints to your attention because it, we cannot have a situation where all the complaints come to the office when they should firstly start at the mine. So that is another point that uh, I, I wish that we can also, uh, I mean, also put more focus on. So let's just move to the next uh, the slide. Then the under engineering related uh, concerns, we 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 have we we all know that um, you know all the quarries normally you know the, we've got clients coming into into the mines to come in for sales, and what is worth mentioning is that if a client comes into your quarry, they become you've got a responsibility to ensure that the the type of trucks that come into your quarry must comply to certain standards otherwise if i'm coming with my truck to buy it and it runs out of control it's a mine accident so it impacts on um it's a it's a critical uh, area that obviously we need to also ensure that we it's given attention and um also the issues of i mean all open cast mines and quarries, the issue of TMM interaction and whole road designs and also all basically all the related controls uh, uh, must always be emphasized. Fatigue management as well. And also the tipping activities. Um, you know, we, we have seen a number of um, incidents where, you know, they where they took place uh, whilst uh, tipping uh, operations were, were being conducted. So that is just to, you know, to, 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 to mention uh, that, uh, please, uh, colleagues, let's, let's not be complacent on, on those matters. And also the issue of illumination, if I think I forgot to just mention it, on under point number two. So we, we need to make sure that uh, you know, if, but I, I don't think we've got a lot of quarries, so if there are any that are operating at night, but if there is, then that is uh, an important point. So we can move to the next slide. Yeah, so there is a directive that was uh, released, sent out from the, uh, the office of the PI. 
And the directive basically deals with, because we had a lot of fire-related incidents. Uh, lately, remember the Palavora uh, incident, uh, we had one at Hurehope, we had one at Sasol. So lately we've been having challenges with um, fire-related uh, fire incidents uh, related to the use of conveyables. So there's a directive that is trying to address uh, basically the fundamental uh, problems that lead to that. But I just want to, to mention that uh, it, it's, it's mostly for coal underground mines and also uh, underground hard rock mines. And it will only apply to the quarries if, let's say, you've got a conveyor belt that passes through a tunnel. And because that tunnel then will be a confined space like an underground situation. So the, the the directive will only apply in that case. But if you don't have any tunnel, then it 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 um it they will not uh, really affect you. Uh, let's just move to the next um, slide. Yeah. So basically, what the the directive is trying to 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 emphasize is on the fact that, or rather it says that if all the mines within the next 60 days, they need to come up with a plan, submit a plan to the office on what are they going to do with their, their non-fire retardant uh, conveyor belts. And in the next 12 months, after 12 months, no mine will be allowed to operate with conveyor belts that are non-fire uh, retardant. So, and the expectation is that when you go purchase a conveyor belt, you need to ensure that it's fire retardant and also there must be a certificate uh, proof, as proof that the OEM has gone to Tlepos Boss and uh, to undertake uh, to subject the, their product to the test, fire retardant test that is conducted at that uh, facilities. And also the certificate will be valid for, for five years. So yeah, that's basically so. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, that's uh, here it's just covering what I was mentioned that uh, the mines have got 60 days to come up with a plan and also 12 months to ensure that all their, fire, the, their conveyor belts are fire retardant. So let's move to the next presentation, the next slide. And here we've got uh, two COPs. Uh, so what happened is that the guidelines from the Chief Inspector of Mines were revised. And obviously the revisions uh, will, the revision on the noise and the thermal stress COPs. And also the, revi the revisions uh, affect the reporting forms. So, but because the revisions were uh, effective, I mean, uh, will be effective in from uh, the first of May. That is obviously in the in the middle of the year. The the expectation, or rather, they say that mines will have to start reporting on the new forms from next year. So those are the the changes that uh, we have. And uh, yeah, I think uh, this is all that we wanted to pass to you, colleagues. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Mangos. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rudolph. That was very informative. Um, I've also, I think you have helped us with the presentation today because there's other information which I've also missed, which um, I haven't received. And uh, without your assistance today, maybe I would have missed that information to deadlines but yeah thank you so much i don't know if any person does uh, have any questions uh for 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 rudolph you can raise your hand Mangoba, i've, I've got uh, actually more not a question but more of a, um, a comment um, we've noticed that uh, a lot of the issues and a, little, a lot of this what 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 Rudolph has raised is certainly in the uh, community um, 
involvements and, and, and community issues. Um, it's a common it's a common thread that's running throughout uh, the country. We've noticed it with mining all over the all over the country, and uh, yeah, I think it's it's just a, a very good thing that you actually highlighted it, uh, Rudolf, because uh, community issues are be are or not are becoming have become a, a major contributing factor to the success or failure of operations. So thank you very much for pulling that in. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Any other questions? Um, Rudolf, from my side, um, I wanted to ask regarding the conveyor belt um, directive uh, that was issued, um, because I see that it says uh, only for affected mines, the affected mines are given 60 days, and then um, also uh, all non-fire retardant conveyors must be phased out within 12 months. Is this the second, the second point, will it be for all mine, mining um, companies or for certain mining um, uh, uh, um, companies? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mangova. So basically the directive is for underground mines, your underground coal mines, and also oh. your underground hard rock mines. And it only affects the quarries in a case where you've, you, you've got a, let's say, a tunnel, because the tunnel creates more like an underground excavation situation. So, so, so in that case, then the, the directive will, will, will apply. But if you don't have such a setup, then it will not apply. But obviously, it's information that we have to disseminate and ensure that all the mines go back and check is this relevant to us if it's not then yeah it's, um, it's good but if it is you've got an a situation that resembles an underground uh, uh, situation then it, it will apply but if you don't have any confined uh you know environment where um a conveyor belt passes through then it, it it's not as it, it's, it will not apply to you because remember the risk of fire the risk of fire is that if let's say underground if there is fire then it affects the the ventilation it affects you know so but if it's an open cast i mean it's an um, it's a quarry like yours if there is fire the the smoke will not be channeled to 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 or rather will not be really affecting you unlike if it's an underground mine so that is that is the difference and i think with with any because later i think they've shared that uh, directive with you if there's any questions that any clarification that you seek you can always contact mr maquela uh, stephen maquela the senior hygiene inspector and I think uh, he will provide any clarity that uh, you need in that regard. Thank you so much, uh, Rudolf. I think it's um, quite clear. Thank you so much. Um, okay, any questions? Anyone? No questions. It was loud and clear. Um, okay. With that being said, we will move um, to our ne next item on the agenda. Um, apologies, I've received an apology from, from Leticia. Uh, she couldn't join, uh, uh, something um, came up, uh, so she couldn't join for the meeting. Um, she won't be able to present today. Uh, uh, okay, before we move to, 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 to the next item on Jan, um, Anthony, Mangova, can we then slot the uh, uh, the health and safety presentation into there? Otherwise, it might, you know, it's going to be a bit long. And then do health and safety where Letitia was, and then do Jan, and then I'll do env the uh, environmental side. If you are ready, uh, perfect, Anthony, you can kick in. Okay, let me just uh, share.
sorry, it was the wrong one. Eh? Can you see it? Perfect, thank you. Okay. All right, folks, yes, uh, th thank you very much. Um, uh, Marius, unfortunately, um, was uh, double booked. Well, we actually moved the meeting, so he, he'd already uh, committed to an audit today. So he asked me just to run through this, uh, um, to do his, or I volunteered, should I say, um, on the health and safety side of, of the audits for 2021 um, and the way forward. So um, just bear in mind, I'm doing it on behalf of Marius van der Winter, uh, and I wasn't part of these audits, so, uh, but I will uh, certainly, I've spoken to him and got a lot of the information. So all um, on the 2021 side, all the SPASA members didn't take part in the ISH audits, um, and, and it is still mandatory. So, uh, you know, I think folks must uh, start getting those things back into, into line. Uh, you, we, we've passed the COVID stage now, and it's important that uh, all members um, are, are, are part of, of our audits. Uh, there's still a very high level of commitment and compliance to requirements and financial constraints that have been limited. Um, I, I want to stick my head out here and say we, we mustn't uh, use financial constraints as, a, as, a, as an excuse not to have our our safety practices in, and processes at the highest possible level. So, uh, you know, it, it can't be used as an excuse anymore. Uh, health and safety systems, as Mario said, were rather they were maintained rather than looking at the tr for true challenges. So again, it, it, the first, the, to, to the previous point, guys, we, we can't relax on this. We cannot have people getting hurt. I'm not even talking about uh, uh, fatalities and, and and I think there we we share very strongly what what Rudolph was saying earlier on. Uh, we we've got a good record, but we need to maintain that record and improve it so that we actually have no injury, not even a first aid injury. And it is possible. It really and truly is possible. Uh, COVID fatigue. It it is there. It is a factor. People are tired. Um, and, and, and worn down by the COVID restrictions. So it, it's important that, that site uh, people in charge of sites think outside of the box and actually get uh, put things in place that, that uh, invigorate the, the staff and the, and the employees to, to be more conscious of, of accidents and incidents. So let's reduce those. The, um, that, that's, that was basically an, an overview of, of 2021. But the, the audits that were conducted in 2021, we did 69 safety audits. Uh, and uh, as you can see, there are 48 in 2020 and 94 in 2019. So it shows that it is picking up again. Uh, we understand that there are people who have sort of cut costs and uh, it's important, but I think it's a very important thing to do because it just makes us sharper and, and gets... Uh, gets everyone back on their toes and, and keeps the, the standard high. The average score went down a quarter of a percent uh, to 89.19 percent. Highest was 97.63 and lowest was 70.41. And it just shows, you know, if, you, if someone can score 97.63, then the rest can as well. It is, it is achievable. It's difficult, but, you know, what is the value of of, of us having high scores, the value is that we don't hurt people and we don't uh, uh, have accidents. So I think it's, it's it's critically important. Out of the audits, there were nine show place operations. That's a 95% plus, which is fantastic. Uh, 33 operations had a five shield, that's 90 to 95. And uh, there were 19 of four shields and three of uh, uh, eight of, of th three shield status. Um, you know, the, we were talking about something the other day at one of the uh, audits I did. To move from the 90 to 95 plus is very difficult. To move from 60 to 80 is quite easy. So uh, those guys in the show place operations, well done and, and congratulations to them. 
Um, the school's perception, and this is a very interesting part of, of, of the audits, and it actually runs, the, the two audits that we do, the environmental one and, and the safety one, run very, very similar, have very similar uh, results. Uh, the context of organization, you'll notice, is a bit low. Leadership is, is, is good. Leadership and worker participation, the legal appointments, the interactions, that's quite good. And then actions to address risks and opportunities. Guys, this is a critical one. You've got to make sure that you get this, uh, you know, don't, don't let that slip down. Things like PTOs and, and, and that sort of thing are critical. Uh, what do you do when something is reported to you that is wrong or that somebody noticed that, that, that something is wrong? What is the action that is done? And then uh, objectives and planning is good. Resources, competence, awareness is good. Communication was nice and high. Documented information was reasonable. It's actually good. Control of documented information was good. Operational planning and control was good. Emergency preparedness and response. That was a little bit lower. I see Marius hasn't noticed it red, but I found that on the environmental side as well. It's 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 a it's a gap. So have a just keep an eye on that. Then uh, monitoring, measurement, analysis, and performance evaluation was needs to be looked at. Internal audits are good. Management reviews are good. And then the improvement. And I think this goes with the previous slides where we said the, the finances are not there. So we need to make, 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 make a plan there. Uh, improvements don't always need to cost money. You can do a very good improvement with, with little money. So just you know, start thinking out the box. But all in all, average compliance was 89%, which I think is, is, is reasonable. If we take all the all the operations that were audited, so uh, yeah, well done to these past members. Um, these are your Showplace Award people: um, Met in Kwakwa, Midmar Quarry, which is an independent, Kwala Quarry, an independent, um, and the rest were, were were from the the, the corporates. But what was interesting is those top, the two, number two and three were independent. So yeah, it, uh, well done to them. They've, they've really done a, a sterling job there. The positives, um, it's still a very high level of compliance on COVID-19 protocols, the face masks, sanitizing, social distancing, very good. So keep it up, let's, 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 let's keep, keep this, this uh, uh, pandemic under control. Uh, health and safety conditions were sustained and maintained throughout the industry under difficult conditions, which is great. There was an improvement in the machine guarding requirements. Uh, as you all know, Marius is, is a, he seems to find a, a machine guard that's not the way it should be. He's got a nose for it. Um, so guys, yeah, we need to look at that. Some uh, operations made some big capital improvements. Uh, to the crushing and screening plants and to further improve health and safety standards. Mine development went in according to mine planning and there were no serious incidents recorded of mine failure or blasting incidents. So, uh, Rudolf, uh, again, yeah, thank you for your, your, your compliments. Uh, I think a lot of hard work is going into this. No, no mining fatalities were recorded for the auditing period. However, a few noise-induced hearing losses, and, and that was uh, something which I will also cover under the environmental side. Uh, Rudolf covered that in his side on, on noise. Uh, we need to make sure that that's, that's sorted out. Um, and employees are better informed about their requirements and knowledge on safe working conditions. The sharing of information a uh, crucial aspect of the audit process with quarry managers. And uh, what Maurice has found is that the guys are always very eager to learn of what other operations are doing and what legal, leading practices um, are uh, available. So, you know, uh, I found that as well on the environmental side. Um, site staff and teams always want to know. And they always ask you, you know, what can we do with this and help us here? And, and what do we do here? And it's only a pleasure from our from a sparse side to be able to share that information, um, you know, and and spread good ideas. It it just gets the industry at a better level, and that's what we want. Uh, we we obviously want to work together with the authorities and the DMRE, and uh, we share a common goal, and that is uh, zero harm. The focus and the way forward. 
there were too many last time injuries. One is too many. So, uh, yeah, disabling injuries, reportable injuries, and occupational diseases for, for that reporting period. We need to reduce that. And we're really going to make every effort to, to get this down. Uh, identification of risks and or non-compliances. We found the own inspections are a bit poor. Uh, final development and implementation of traffic management plans came to a stop. Uh, the, the, most of the quarries that uh, Marius has looked at are not up to speed. Uh, and, and folks, it's it's important. Aspasa will help you with this, and you've got to get it done. It is a requirement. It's a legal requirement. Um, forget about the collision prevention systems at this point. Get this. Get your traffic management plans in place, because without them, your collision prevention systems are also not effective, or as effective. So you know, and it's not difficult. It really and truly isn't difficult. So if you need help, please contact Nico, and we've got people that can help you. Uh, on TMM check, uh, checklist, the compliance uh, has it on, on the pre-starts. We've not. Anthony, your sound seems to be disappearing. I'm back. Thank you, yes. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, compliance on your TMM pre start checklists, uh, your hazard classifications, guys are operating with no go findings. So, and that, you know, what's the purpose of your checklist uh, if, 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 if you're letting the, the machine operate without um, on, on a no go? It, it's crazy, it shouldn't be done at all. Uh, then we found that a bit of poor housekeeping in plants that uh, contributes to dust exposure and access to machinery. Uh, again, you know, I've seen that as well from the environmental side. Some, some plants are fantastically, they really well run, others need to pull their socks up. But dust is a big issue and we'll talk about that later as well. Then there was a bit of uh, poorer compliance to isolation and lockout requirements. Um, uh, which which we want to get sorted out. Okay, so I, I'm just going to get to the right slides again. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, right. Okay, so the other thing is poor um, uh, accident and incident investigations. PTOs, plant task observations, needs attention, it closes the loop. Uh, compliance of, of work, women in mining, HIV and TB, dispensing of condoms, etc. Near miss reporting and recording of Section 23 refusals. Guys, that, that, that is a, a really important part of, of what, uh, what needs to be done. Um, and then contractor management. Um, there... You know, Rudolph also uh, alluded to that with the trucks and things. All people that come onto your site are your employees and you are responsible for them. So it's important that you actually have make sure that those people are properly trained and are aware of what they need to do. Then something which we have spoken about previously is the training programs that have been fast-tracked by training service providers. Uh, with the eventual qualifications really not uh, not being good. And then qualifications that are not recorded on the MTA database, and they, eventually the employees don't receive their, their certification. Um, yeah, it's, it's important that you make sure whoever's going to do your training is credible and that they are registered and that they do things in the right way and that the content of that training is what it should be. Just a picture of a... Of a quarry, I don't, not quite sure what Maurice wanted to show us here. Um, yeah, uh, that I can, I can tell you is a nice walkway, a pedestrian, a segregation um, on on one of the quarries. It's a nice, neat operation. Looks good. A very nice part of a of a viewpoint here, neatly done, uh, away from all operations. 
and and uh, it, it shows you the mine the picture of the mine plan there and the whole story. So it's very nice to be able to see an operation like that. Uh, Marius is one of his pets is tools and homemade tools. Whoever's ever been on an audit with him will know that he finds them somehow. I don't know how he does it. I think he might have some in his pocket which he finds. But anyway, but this is a very nice toolbox and uh, uh, well neatly done professional. You can see that the mechanic uh, or the, the mechanic involved here is really proud of his work. And this is this is fabulous. Nice tunnel with a uh, uh, new, this was a new operation with the escape tunnel on the left hand side there. You can see it. Um, yeah. Uh, so when you do make modifications, please make provision for that. It, it's always a good thing to have. Also nicely done here. It's a new, new operation. They've put it together very neatly done. Again, also in the guarding is good. Um, this is also an, uh, one of the top uh, performers. Um, you can see a nice, neat little operation. And uh, I'm going to use this slide in my presentation on the environmental side. So we'll talk about that just now. Also nicely done here. All new, new in installations, and uh, these are, are, are neat. Another well run quarry. And another one. And another one, so yeah, it looks good. Uh, all nice and neat, I suppose. You know, remember these are on days of audits, so uh, uh, you can uh, imagine the guys really cleaned up. This particular picture, um, if you look at the on the left hand side, there's a head pulley there with a very nice screen. What they've done there, this this particular operation is in a high windy area and dust was a problem, and they've uh, engineered. A solution to reduce the dust. You can never, of course, eliminate it completely, but that certainly made a huge impact to the reduction of their dust levels. And that didn't cost a lot of money. And again, nicely run operations. And that uh, is that. If there are any um, uh, questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Nothing? Thank you right. so much, Anthony. Okay, mm -hmm. good stuff. Any questions? Feel free to ask any question. Thank you, Anthony, for the presentation. Um, a couple of things that I've also picked up. Um, I, they said there's too many LTIs um, or dis and disabling injuries. Uh, we need to look at that at the industry. You know, um, an LTI on the bed's view, it's the second uh, one. The next one, which is the last one, is then LTI. So we are almost there. If you get too many LTIs, you're definitely calling for, for a fatality. So Rudolf have mentioned and uploaded and, um, that we, we have done well uh, in the past years. We haven't had any, any fatalities um, in the past five years as the, the quarries or the other um, in the industry. Um, so we shouldn't, uh, we must keep our eyes and our focus on this before we lose uh, that uh, uh, um, record. And remember, it's a person, we're working with people, uh, whoever dies, I mean, he, he has a family, he's looking after um, a couple of people in that uh, 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 space. So it's important we, we, we look at that. And also, traffic management, um, it was also on, on Rudolf's presentation. Um, it is clear it is an issue um, everywhere in our industry. We need to, 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 to uh, look at that. We need to put a bicycles and see what needs to be done. Uh, Mosh is there to assist a, 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 a with good practices on how to implement um, traffic management on your, on, your, on your side. So I think it's important we look at that. Uh, stand up, look, seek for help, and um, they will assist you. It won't cost you that much um, uh, uh, to implement a proper traffic management on your on your on your site. And well done to the once again, well done to the um, small operations that have made it to number two and three. 
um, if such small um, organizations or one man show, as they call it, uh, can make it uh, to, to that position, I don't know what's stopping the bigger organizations to, 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 to do it. And in, in case there's more benefits on doing this, it's the right thing that needs to be done. We need to comply in order to save um, our employees and uh, to, to, to reduce the number of injuries we are currently um, acquiring. Thank you so much. If there's no questions, I uh, will move to, to Jan. Um, I think Jan is on the line. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jan Jenop, and I think uh, most of you will recognize me from the, the PDS sector. Um, I've joined a new company called FMS, Filtration Management Systems, and uh, we will introduce you to a best practice that not will only save you guys money, but also the best practice will fall in under the health and safety guidelines that will also be of assistance. So I'll basically just open up the floor for my managing director, uh, Steve Witcher. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Jan, and thank you everyone for giving us the opportunity um, to present or show, show you how we uh, since 2015, Filtration Management Solutions has been adding a lot of value to the industrial sector as well as uh, some of the mining sector as well. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Stephen Witcher. I am the Managing Director of Filtration Management Solutions. FMS is the uh, appointed uh, sales and services partner for a company uh, that comes out of the USA called Deskcase. Um, they also own a company in the Netherlands, which is essentially uh, where we get our support from, from a technical perspective, uh, called RMF Systems. Um, just to point out, um, although the name suggests filtration, uh, that is not all we do. We are more of a consulting, educating and strategy business. Um, yes, we do have products and services that uh, fit into the filtration side, but ultimately we view ourselves as as consultants. So um, what I'm going to show you today is generally a, a typically an hour to an hour and a half presentation. However, I have um, slimmed it down a bit to try and keep within our time guidelines here today. Um, so it's really going to be a, a high level view of what we look at and ultimately some of the solutions that we implement as Jan said, to save you money on your operation, uh, but also with regards to some of those solutions, we uh, touch on some of the health, safety and environmental issues as well. Uh, just before I start, um, if you have any questions, you're not familiar with some of the, the technical things that we're going to be discussing or I'm going to be showing you, please pop a message um, uh, into the, um, the message box here that we can deal with it at a, another time where we have a bit more time. So I'm going to get into it. Uh, as I've said already, we're going to be looking at contamination control, control strategies to better machine reliability and lubrication or lubricant health. Typically, oh, give me two seconds, sorry. Uh, just an overview of what we're going to be looking at today is lubricated equipment, uh, equipment failures, sources and types of contamination that we find in the uh, uh, equipment itself, strategies for operational reliability improvements, what type of action plans do we need to put together, our condition monitoring. So are we actually measuring the essentially the oil, which is the blood line or really it, it, we we look at it oil as if it's the same as the blood running in your body the cleaner we can keep and the drier we can keep your oil the longer your machines will run uh, very similar to to your body the cleaner your blood and more healthy your blood the typically the longer you're going to live and a healthier life and then we'll look at some industry references so the stuff that i'm going to show you now is typically um, for process plant or industrial sector. However, a lot of the applications, especially on hydraulic systems, can be applied or are applied to mobile equipment, uh, excavators, dump trucks, uh, those types of pieces of equipment. So, so bear that in mind. 
Uh, the first thing is really let's look at what environment we are operating our machines in. You guys are, um, I mean, most most people on this call are going to be very familiar with the type of environment. It's a very dusty. Uh, we've spoken about dust already on this call, um, and humid at times as well. So a lot of moisture that finds its way into our assets. Uh, the dust that you typically see on the floor over here is per particle is actually submicron. So if you actually had to look at it with the, the try and look at it with the human eye, you actually wouldn't be able to tell that it's a, it's actually there. Uh, what people don't understand is those submicron particles, once they enter uh, your machines, actually can cause a lot of damage. So typically we are trying to keep out that contamination from the environment out of the equipment so that we can uh, obviously exclude it so that it doesn't cause problems within the operations of your equipment. Um, it, wh what are the challenges that we find in, in lubricated equipment? So typically we've got three, um, three processes, if you can call it that. We have centralized lubricating systems for, for bearing lubrication, hydraulic systems that typically will have servo or proportional valves, with tight tolerances and typically quite expensive pieces of, of components, and then gearboxes for power transmission. And as I've said, we looked at the environment that they're operating in, but what do they operate under? So often 24-7 operation, high speeds and loads, high and low temperatures, as I've said already, high humidity, containment of, uh, of air, and obviously, you know, with plant washdowns has uh, the ability to get that contamination or that water into, into the equipment and how do we seal that and make sure it doesn't. So what are the challenges? We need to, as I've said already, ensure clean, dry and cool oil flows through all the components so that it can you know, function properly and generate the right and, and pr precise movements through the, the manufacturing or production process. Mainly we want to avoid premature components and system breakdowns. Uh, just a quick kind of overview of where does the contamination come from? So if we have to look at a hydraulic system like this, a lot of the time the ingress of contamination is through the vents or openings on the, on the top of a, uh, a tank lid or, or such. Uh, condensation or pretty much following on from contamination from the, the environment. Moisture gets in through the, the opening or the vent cap. Um, and Although it's not water at the present time, it's, it's essentially vapors or um, mist, it would settle on the top of the tank here, just underneath the bottom, and we would then con condensate it into water that would find its way into the well, and we'll see a little later on how it can affect the health of your machine. Uh, contaminated new fluid is a, is a misconception that a new drum of oil is clean. A new drum of oil with regards to its chemical properties is new. However, the new drum of oil is not clean enough in order to meet the standards that your OEM actually regards um, to be clean enough to operate that piece of machine to its 100% of its uh, life expectancy. We also have an issue in the, in the industry where um, uh, people mix different types of fluids. So we would call that cross-contaminating. So adding the wrong fluid is a contaminant that we would view. Uh, particulate contamination from new or repaired components during maintenance activities, a lot of issues with that. And then internally generated wear particle contamination and insolubles actually through the, through the gears. Um, water contamination through leaking heat exchanges and coolers uh, also problem in the industry. If we look at a gearbox, very similar ingress through contamination through the ports or vents, condensation at the top of the of the headspace. Once again, contaminated new fluid fluid or adding wrong fluid. Ingress through damaged seals. And, you know, a lot of people will be aware that seals don't last forever. And once that seal has uh, Worn away and being damaged, we we allow essentially the contamination from the oil will get in through to your seals and cause internally generated wear through particle contamination and insolubles. So if we look at particle contamination for a second, um, a lot of people are not aware of the fact that 82% of mechanical wear is caused by particle contamination. So part of our strategy is well, how do we reduce that factor? Because 
as soon as we have particle contamination, we are generating wear and more wear uh, increases the chance of your machine actually failing. Uh, one of the things that we do look at is what components are you working with on your machine and what are the, the clearances in on a micron level um, between moving parts. So you can see on a server valve, well, for argument's sake, these uh, clearances are between one and four micron. Now, one and four micron, you cannot see with the, na the naked eye. Um, it, it's microscopic. Uh, gear pumps, for argument's sake, the uh, tooth to tip to case is 0.5 micron to 5 micron. It's a very tight tolerances that we're talking about. Um, just quickly on with regards to the relative component life that you would typically want to expect out of your component um, and then looking at your ISO cleanliness code. And at, at this point, if uh, you're not familiar with an ISO cleanliness code uh, and what that represents, please pop us a message and we are more than willing to, to go through the exercises. It is a, a lengthy one with lots of tables, but uh, just to, to quickly represent, uh, this ISO cleanliness code 242219 is what we would consider extremely dirty. Um, if you go further down the graph here, 14.12.9 is pretty clean. That's We would like to aim for that. And what this graph tells you is that if we have to look at a hydraulic system, is if we, we were running at 242219, we've actually reduced that component life to less than 25%. Whereas it if we wanted to get to 100% of its life, we would want to achieve an ISO cleanliness code of 16, 14, 11. So that is the amount of solid particles as well as the size of the solid particles sitting in your lubricant. So you can actually relate it back to a graph in terms of relative component life. Another contaminant is water contamination. Um, there's three different, uh, I suppose, stages of water, water contamination in oil. Uh, again, if you'd like to know more details, we'd be happy to go through that with you. But similar type of graph in terms of what is for a bearing, uh, element bearing or journal bearing, for argument's sake, what is the relative bearing life percentage? And if we have to uh, correlate it to water contamination, this is a parts per million figure. Once again, let's look at a journal bearing. If we wanted to achieve 100% life factor, on that bearing, we would need to keep the water levels in and around 100 ppm, 150 ppm. And as soon as that um, uh, water increases, you can see typically the relative component life would, would start to decrease. Uh, just for interest sake on lubricants and, and hydraulic oils, uh, typically we would have a base oil with additives uh, that makes up the certain properties of the of the oil, uh, each additive or the set of additives that a, a lubricant supplier or manufacturer would add to a base oil is dependent on the application and the component or machine that we're using. And these base oils and additives or your lubricants you're using on a machine are subjected to certain things through the whole process. Uh, a lot of heat, oxygen, different lubricants, uh, as I've said already, cross-contaminating or using different lubricants in, in a machine. Water, as we've, as we've gone through already, wear particles, solid contaminants, we, we've gone through det detergents and chemicals, mixing mixing different fluids, pressures and, and air bubbles. And if we uh, leave all of these uh, factors that a lubricant is subjected to, we ultimately start to get to an oxidation process, which is the health of the, the actual properties of the oil being um, degraded, thermal degradation, microdesing, hydrolysis, water washing and corrosion. And if ignored, we typically start to see some nasty things going on. We start to see acids forming corrosion, uh, solubles and insolubles, which is uh, essentially a, a formation of sludge varnish or tars. And we don't want to get to this point. Uh, this is ultimately, you know, varnish we would look at uh, comparatively as cholesterol in your blood. Uh, we all know that it's very dangerous and uh, not something that is easily removable or um, uh, quick to remove at the same time. So out of all of those issues, what can we control? Well, we can control different lubricants being added to a machine 
can control water, wear particles, solid, solid contaminants and detergents and chemicals. Uh, under the contamination control strategy, well, we essentially look at three areas of uh, achievements. First of all, we need to understand what are our targets. We, we can't in, in, uh, implement an improvement program unless we know where, where our set targets are. And once we've set our targets, we would then start to put in actions. And a lot of the time, the actions are a phased approach. Um, we limit the cost of the actions and under those certain phases, it's a lot easier for a customer or for, for a plant to absorb on its, its budget. Uh, and ultimately, then we would look at measuring results. So just uh, quickly in terms of setting targets, uh, how clean or dry should our well be? Well, this is a, a graph that is readily available. Uh, it's not determined by us or desk case. Uh, it's actually determined by the OEMs of your servo valves, your proportional valves. And what they've done uh, has made it a lot easier for us to understand is that if we have a hydraulic system with proportional valves in it, um, in order for that uh, valve to, let's say, last 100% of its life expectancy, we would need to keep that oil, get that oil to an ISO target or particle level target of 16, 14, 12. Um, so that is suggested by the OEM uh, with a moisture level of 150 ppm. As soon as we have dirtier oil, you can essentially see your proportional valves failing a lot more often uh, and hence decreasing the life expectancy of that component. So this is a very nice target cleanliness uh, guideline that we would we would work off. So bringing now into our strategies, we have five phases that we, we try and work to. Uh, a lot of the time it actually starts with storing and transfer. So we look at how you're storing your fluid, how are you transferring it to the asset. A lot of health, safety and environmental issues come up at this point in time. Uh, we look at how do we seal and protect. So how do we keep the second slide or third slide I showed you, the really dirty environment that we're dealing in? How do we seal and protect the asset to make sure that that contamination does not find its way into the piece of equipment uh, from the atmosphere? Uh, once we've done that, we look at how do we filter and purify to keep the contamination under control? How do we view and assess part of our targets and action plans to actually understand uh, whether our contamination control strategy is working? And then how do we measure and monitor? So if we start at store and transfer, which I think um, you know is something that uh, is, is underlooked by, by a lot of people in the industry, is something like that. Where, where do we store our lubricants? Uh, although this might look pretty well organized or clean, you can still see that there's an oil spill over here. Um, there's open containers, obviously, to the environment, and this is a hydrocarbon that we're dealing with. This uh, oil, oil drum over here, you know, from a health and safety perspective, uh, very easy for somebody to walk past here. Their overall jacket, you know, it's happened to me on site a few times, gets caught, and all of a sudden we've got a, a big drum on the oil that's causing spillage, uh, dirty rags, um, yeah, just uh, you know, a, a not not a good situation from a health and safety perspective. But at the same time, um, you know, how do we know that this lubricant is supposed to be put into uh, machine ID one two three uh, and not four five six? Um, so there's no real uh, clear visual as to which lubricant should be used in what piece of machinery. Um, so that's when we start looking at, uh, you know, what are our main goals with lubricant handling? So, you know, we want to try and get to a state where we have clearly identifiable uh, containers, closed containers, so not open to the environment. We're limiting spills, um, which obviously is an environmental issue, but it also could be a health and safety issue with uh, slips and falls. So this is a, a good picture. So we have different types of products to uh, ensure that we get to a kind of standard with regards to lubricant storage and, and transfer. Um, here, I, I think you would agree that this is a mess. Um, you know, opportunities, once again, health and, and safety issues with slips and falls. 
So this is a uh, actual Lubrum that was done. Uh, uh, Deskcase uh, has a reliability services team, which um, basically we need to take details of of a customer's current facility, and they would then propose a design, and ultimately that is the end product. Nice, clean housekeeping. All the lubricants are stored uh, in their relevant or respective containers. We've got nice bundled areas in case there is a oil spill. Safety cabinets with certain PPE if we need. Uh, it's just really a, a nice scenario to be in. Uh, quickly on to some sealing and protecting. Uh, I'm not sure if you are, are familiar, you might be with typical OEM dust caps or breather ports. Now, these breathers uh, don't keep out large micron, well, they keep out large micron uh, size particles, but sub micron particles, not, not at all. And just represented to you, um, showing that submicron particles is actually one of the issues. You can see a bit of oil spill here. Um, so we want to look at sealing and protecting. So we fundamentally, part of our job is to replace the OEM dust caps, and we call them, they're not really filters, they're just dust caps, uh, with high efficiency and um, high quality, mostly most of the time desiccant breathers. Although you might be in, uh, operating in a, in a relatively dry environment, there is still moisture in the air that needs to be contained or excluded from the tank. You can see here in a hydraulic system, as soon as the hydraulic system uh, starts to operate, the oil level drops and will return back. Um, and we want to keep that contamination from the atmosphere out of the system itself. But the way the breather actually works, is that if there is any moisture within the headspace of the system, the breather would actually remove that moisture from the head system, uh, headspace as well. Um, part of the process is to view and assess. How do we know we are keeping the oil clean and dry if we can't actually see it? So a lot of the time we see on sites visual sight glasses where they are stained, they've got a line. I, I can't really see the, the condition of the oil or the level of the oil here. Uh, typically, you would have to look at this oil side gloss straight on, uh, and sometimes if a gearbox or a pump is is uh, configured on a plant uh, in a manner where you actually can't see it straight on, we have issues with, with visual inspections. So just a little view of a product that we do supply is called the 3D, 3D Bullseye, whereas if, a, if you can't view it from straight on, you now can walk past the box or pump whatever piece of equipment you've installed this on, and you have a 360 degree view. You can view if there's water lying there, if there's some black particles, but most importantly is that do we have enough oil in that in that machine? Uh, just showing you the 3D bullseye is an oil level gauge. This one's actually got what we call an oil sight glass connected to it. So if there's any water within the uh, pump or gearbox, the component that you've installed it on, you can visually inspect that and see the water sitting in there and there's a little drain port at the bottom so you can get rid of that free water as, as soon as possible. Um, also part of the, the um, seal view and uh, seal and view is that you can see this component beforehand. How do we actually look at whether this component has got oil in it, whether it's full to the top, whether it's got oil in it at all. So as part of the modification plans is that we have drain port adapters, which are quick connect uh, technology so that we limit the amount of oil spillage when we're draining a, a gearbox. Uh, we can view the oil level at the same time and we've done our job with regards to sealing and protecting it on a on a desk with a desk and breather. Uh, a little bit better view of this one. This is a full drain port adapter, which has got a sampling point. Nice, we can take the sample of the oil. Uh, it's got the quick connect to drain the gearbox. And on the top here, you can see they've actually put a, a breather port adapter as well, which has got a quick connect over there. So that allows you now to transfer new oil into this component with uh, limited oil spills because it's all quick connect. Uh, once again, uh, we're touching on the health and safety and environmental issues. This is a uh, well site glass, uh, similar to the picture I just showed you before. So we, we have those types of modification plans. Uh, once again, you know, I think this one uh, is set for um, 
the modification plans for Sulza, for um, PCW Eurodrive, uh, where typically the model of a gearbox or a pump is in our database to understand what components would fit best for that specific model. Um, filter and purify, I will see I'm, I am running out of time, my apologies. Uh, filter and purify, uh, once again, we look at the hydraulic system. So a lot of your pressure filters rely on the system pressure, your flow rates and your pressure drops. So they are not able, your system filters, OEM filters, are not able to remove the high level of contaminants, uh, micron-sized particles, water sludge or soft particles like varnish, keep out the contamination. Uh, we need to remove or replace that uh, OEM dust cap and then bring the cleanliness level back to, to target ISO class. So this is a little bit of where we get involved. We look at, once again, high quality, high efficiency desk and breathers. We have plug and play solutions with in what we call our OLUs, offline, uh, offline unit, offline filtration unit. These can be dedicated or permanent uh, uh, piece of equipment or mobile periodic filtration. What's nice about this is that we don't need to actually do any changes on your system in terms of piping in or anything like that. They are plug and play uh, units. Uh, we utilize the drain port and uh, breather port adapters to have your suction port and then return port. So no modification plans need to be done. We then also have a BPU, which is a bypass unit that can be uh, essentially taken off the pilot line of your system. Um, this we use a lot in mobile equipment, dump trucks, excavator, hydraulic systems. And then we do have uh, vacuum dehydration uh, removal, water removal technology as well for high levels of, of water contamination. Uh, just a quick table on, you know, the, the benefits of dedicated filtration as opposed to mobile or, or periodic. Um, you know, what we typically see in periodic filtration is a customer will call us out when their contaminant or cleanliness levels have reached the worst. We'll come out with a rental or mobile machine and all of this is a cost. Travel, labor, accommodation, filter elements. And as we get to that point over there, everybody's happy. We remove the machine, we come back home. But within a week or so, contamination starts to climb again. And we get to that point and we are called out and we are, are essentially the customers uh, incurring more costs. And this carries on happening. As opposed to dedicated filtration, your essentially uh, uh, costs are, are quite not quite high. They are, are higher um, at some point in time. But once you have got your cleanliness level down to a manageable level, your your actually your cost actually starts to level out. And your uh, I'm equating this to cost at this point of view because we're also um, you know we're all so concentrated on cost saving and how much is it is going to cost. But ultimately. It's also an ISO benefit as well. We maintain that ISO cleanliness class over a period of time as opposed to peaks and troughs like this. A last section is our measure and monitor. So very important, uh, the difference between oil contamination and degradation. So it's a fact that oil degrades over time. It does not last forever. The additives are broken down. And ultimately, once they have broken down to a certain point, uh, it's no longer fit for use. Uh, contamination, on the other hand, where we talk about particles in water, that significantly accelerates the degradation process. So essentially, if we are able to remove and contain the contamination, i.e. particles in water, we then are slowing down the degradation process. What that means is, is that we were able to extend the lifetime of your lubricant as well by an average between three to seven times. Well, what does that mean? We are reducing your carbon footprint at the same time. You know, we're not having to discard or condemn oil and then we've got to go through the proper uh, disposal procedures of, of the hydrocarbon and, and the rest of it. So one point I want to put out is contaminated oil does not equal degraded oil. A lot of people get oil sample reports and they see the contamination levels are high and their first instinct is to take out the oil, discard it and put in new oil. Well, we have strategies to actually remove that contamination and 
essentially extend the use or the lifetime of that oil. Degrading oil loses its chemical and physical properties. We've already discussed that. And contamination causes the formation of secondary or severe contaminations such as sludge, acids, and varnish. We don't want to get to that level. Uh, quickly, some of our measuring and monitoring methods. We have, uh, you know, typically you would take an oil sample, send it off to the lab. It might take a few days to come back. Um, and, you know, hopefully we've got a sampling uh, frequency program in terms of, you know, the criticality or the high value of your, your asset. Uh, is it once a month or three months? Um, and we have to ask, well, is that, you know, is it often enough? You know, are we sampling often enough to understand? Uh, so some of the products, we do have portable particle counters. These are laboratory approved particle counters where you can take a sample on site and uh, get your ISO cleanliness co uh, code, your water percentage saturation, so how much water is sitting in there, and at the same time temperature. We also have permanent online monitoring sensors. I think the next slide's got a, yeah, there you go. Uh, contamination sensor, so this would give you ISO 4406 cleanliness code, your water percentage saturation, your temperature. Uh, oil quality sensor, so this, this is a very good piece of equipment. This constantly checks the health of your lubricant while it's in operation. So as soon as a parameter changes, something degrades, uh, contamination enters, it will give you a red light to say something is going on with your oil please go and take a sample for the laboratory to analyze and further um, uh, diagnose. We do have uh, um, sensor-based technology for desiccant breathers that will also tell us the lifetime of the breather, where the moisture is coming from. Is it coming from the atmosphere or is it coming from the inside of the equipment? And then uh, moisture content uh, sensor. Sometimes uh, on certain applications, we're more interested in what the moisture level is as opposed to the particle level. So we can separate those two as well. What's important to understand is that all of these sensors um, with the communication protocols available can be tied into a cloud-based system uh, or even your control system, SCADA, SAP, uh, all, of, all of those types of things. Uh, just one last thing, where to install. So obviously the breather would be installed where, where you would replace the vent cap. Uh, your oil quality sensor needs to be submerged within that lubricant. Uh, we also have solutions where we can actually install the contamination sensors to the filtration units as well. So while the, the OLU offline units is actually filtering, it's measuring the contamination levels at the same point. There's, there's a clearer picture of, of it there. Um, and then just some final thoughts with regards to sensors. They're very accurate, but they don't actually replace or substitute a, a detailed laboratory. Um, very good in terms of trending, sudden increases um, and lubricant health change over a period of time. They are suitable for critical and high value assets where, you know, replacement costs, um, um, repair and maintenance costs are high or production loss of production costs are, are high. Really, we need to understand whether the cost of the sensor exceeds um, or cost of replacement of the machine exceeds the investment. What's nice about this is when you trend the data, you can actually start learning the health of your machine and start to get into a predictive maintenance strategy as opposed to reactive or planned at this point in time. Uh, just want to go through a few industry applications. Uh, th th these ones you've seen already. Um, uh, what's important to understand or me, for me to point out is that we are a supplementary filtration. So we're not trying to get rid of and we don't look at get rid of, getting rid of your OEM uh, filter filters or filtration system. It's supplementary. And as I say, we don't need to tie into any of the pipelines or engineering changes. It's plug and play supplementary filtration. We, we don't want to uh, mess around with any OEM filter systems. Uh, gearbox on a, on a bridge, um, you can see there's desiccant breather. Everything is closed off. We don't just have pipes lying through the port here. It's all uh, quick connect technology, um, filter system running 24 seven. Uh, power packs, once again, offline unit, breather with the mounting plate. So we, we haven't tied into any or replaced any of the OEM filters here. Uh, excavators on a Hitachi excavator on the hydraulic that we would we took off the pilot line. Um, uh, paper plant. The 
this is a refillable desiccant breather, so you actually don't change the housing at all. You just uh, refill the filter bag and the desiccant. This is what we call a giant offline unit, a dedicated filtration. And then some of the OEMs how have started uh, actually in their workshop putting the, uh, our equipment on their on their power packs uh, and Hellfinger as well, starting to use it as an OEM um, comp uh, OEM product. I know I've run over my deepest apologies for that, uh, but I do hope you got benefit um, and, and it was interesting to you. Uh, if you do have any questions, if we have time for questions, we're very, very um, happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, um, Stephen. Um, any questions? Yeah, you definitely child our time. Eh? <laughs> we left with um, a couple of minutes for two presentations. Anthony, um, I think you can take over. If anyone has questions uh, for Stephen, please you can also pop it up on the on the chat. Um, um, on the, on the conversation, you can just write your question there. Maybe we'll um, get to the questions at the end of the session. Um, is it good with you, Stephen? Thank you. Uh, my once again, deepest apologies. Otherwise, Stephen, um, Anthony, you can. Stephen's um, got to Stephen's <laughs> got to buy lunch next time. Eh? That's, no, that's, the, that's the rule. <laughs> with pleasure, no problem. <laughs> Stephen, do you just want to take your presentation off? No. Brilliant, thank you. Mangova, can you see it? Not yet, Anthony. There you go. Perfect, perfect. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Yes, um, it's up now. Okay. Okay. Folks, yes, uh, it's me again. Good morning. Um, uh, the uh, uh, the topic of this one is is the the new about face environmental audits for 2022 which have already started uh, many of you will have known or been part of the design of the of the revised environmental audit that we've been doing for the last two years so uh, what i want to do here is there are two two audits that we conduct one is an online one and the other is a, um, a physical audit on site i'm going to go quite quickly because we are sort of a bit pressed for time, but uh, if there's anything, you can always contact me at a later stage. So the the flow, the global focus on environmental issues, and, and this uh, Stephen uh, uh, actually touched on this quite a lot, um, is is for if for industry to change the way we do business, and that's been highlighted uh, the need for industry to become more increasingly environmentally aware and compliant. So I, as far as I identified this, and uh, the, the need to continue with the environmental audits. Uh, the audit was needed for, for the industry, which was designed by the industry, and that was an important part of what we did. And uh, the audits were designed by the Sparse Environmental Committee in conjunction with member companies and industry representatives. So it was something that we did for ourselves, by ourselves, and the people that we didn't bring in a consultant on, you know, to, to do, tell us what to do. So the audits, that audits are designed to assist operations to achieve compliance and to equip the managers with the necessary tools to be able to interact with NGOs, communities, stakeholders. You'll notice here stake communities and stakeholders is high on the agenda. And if we go back to what uh, Rudolf was talking about, it's a very, very important part of what we're doing. So the audits are not intended to be a punitive exercise, and they are based on the generic flow of what we do in an operation. If you look at this, this uh, generic flow, Everybody does that at some stage or another. And uh, the top left-hand corner, the EIAs, EMPRs, mining rights, that will be more on the online audit where we check legal compliance and, and the various documentation. Um, the physical audits more on to the rest of the, uh, of the operations. So as I said, they're either annually or uh, online or, or, or physical. Um, it comprises of a training module, the manager's presentation, and the document review. Uh, now, for the managers on site, uh, on, 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 the, on the call, the manager's presentation is actually quite a, an important component. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation and talk about this and a lot of nerves. 
um, the advice from me as the auditor is, guys, you must tell me what you're doing in your operation and follow the guidelines. The better the presentation, the better the audit goes for you. And it, it really, it answers a lot of questions. And we've seen both with online and physical audits that um, the guys that do a good presentation and know what they're talking about get good results. Uh, the physical audit, again, also a training module, physical site assessment and document review. Um, on the physical site assessment, I do a very in-depth walkabout and I look at lots of things. Coming from the industry, I know where the where the, the warts are, so I go specifically and look there, not to catch you out, but to be able to assist you to fix these things. Okay, so, so that's what it's about. And then all... All audits make a provision for uh, sharing of information and discussion. The waiting, that's what it boils down to. Uh, you'll see the high ones, the high scorers are EMPRs, mine plans, uh, social labor plans, environmental performance assessment, financial provisions, water use authorities, managers' presentations. And then on the physical one, mining boundaries, water management, hazardous wastes, material and, and 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 disposal air dust and noise control dust and uh, rudolph also alluded to that community and, and stakeholding management alien vegetation satellite industries and there i just want to stop for half a minute if you have a satellite industry on your site for example a ready mix site or a, a an asphalt or a brick making thing you are responsible for it from an environmental and a health and safety part. Uh, you can get exclusion on the health and safety part, but on environmental, you are responsible for it. So please make sure that you know what you're talking about there. And then, of course, uh, correction of compliance, audit gaps. It doesn't have to be an ASPASA audit. It can be uh, a, a, an internal or external audit that's been done. If those gaps have not been uh, uh, corrected, we're going to have a look at that. And then, of course, the manager's presentation. Uh, this picture, we I show, you saw it in Marius's uh, presentation, and the reason we put I put this in is if you have a look in the background, you can see how the communities are encroaching. This is an operation in KZN. Those communities are encroaching on operations. It's it's a common thing we are seeing across the country. From a confidentiality perspective, uh, the auditors are bound by a sparser confidentiality, and uh, we don't share anything without the express permission. So the online audit, uh, and I'm sorry I'm going a bit fast, but I'll stop on the very important parts. Uh, managers have to have a good understanding of their documentation and compliance requirements. They need to demonstrate a thorough understanding of the mining area and surrounding areas and stakeholder management, including neighbors, communities, and interested and affected parties. So the managers need to know what is going on. And as I've said in many of the audits, I don't expect them to be environmental specialists that's not possible but i certainly uh, the the requirement is that they have a very good working knowledge of what what is expected of them so what is needed all relevant documentation appointments risk assessments and implementation of action plans this goes back to what marius also said you know what are you doing to fix it uh, rudolph also um, alluded to that you've got to have a knowledge of your satellite industries in your mining area and uh, I'm asking you to please share your achievements and actions. Even the small things can often make a big impact. And then managers must please not delegate the presentation to someone else. It's important that you demonstrate your environmental knowledge. Understanding of reports relating to noise and dust levels. Uh, we find, and this was also from the chief inspector of mines, and you just sign them off. They don't know what's in those reports. It's critical they actually do know what it's about. And then environmental complaints, issues, and the methods of resolution. Uh, we've spoken about the audit content, uh, dust and noise testing results, uh, again, from the Chief Inspector of Mines, the 2024 milestones. They're going to be looking at that. Um, waste management, recycling, reusing. Uh, end user certificates, all that sort of thing. And, and Stephen has a very nice, gosh, if, if you, we can get some of those if, uh, systems installed, they're going to score big points on their audits. Water management, what do you do with it? How do you do with it? Your usage volumes, etc. 
And then also your environmental training and awareness, uh, management staff and stakeholders. Um, so it, it's important on that. The appointments, environmental responsible person, people responsible for waste, rehabilitation plans, uh, financial provisions, your proof of submission of assessments and, and EMPRs, financial provision, DMR 128s, quarterly reports, etc. Uh, these are things that we will be looking at to make sure that you are compliant. And then any other topics which you may like to share. Nice glass recycling project. Or it's actually a complete waste recycling project in a rural area. And this was just something which uh, is, is very interesting. It's done just east of Nelspruit and a very successful and uh, wasn't didn't take a lot of money for them to get started. So let's have a look at these things. It makes a huge difference. The, um, the manager's presentation, it, it's a platform that showcases operation. So, you know, you need to show, share as much information with me as possible. More is better. And that that is the online um, uh, operation. If there are any questions up to this point. Right, no. Okay, the physical audit. Again, a, a comprehensive, as I mentioned previously, a comprehensive inspection of the site will be done together with management and staff. And I, I, I will certainly, and I do uh, involve staff. I don't always want to hear what the managers have to say. I want to hear what the guys on the ground have to say because that's where the, the compliance starts. So staff will also be interviewed um, to ascertain their level of environmental awareness. And we found that a lot of guys are not training their staff the way they should. Um, these guys are critical to your success, so make sure it happens. General appearance of the site, uh, we've on the audits I've done so far, I've had good, not so good, and fantastic. So it's out there. Mining boundaries. Folks, you need to know where your mining boundaries are. We don't want Zama Zama in a spa, so it doesn't work like that. So you need to know exactly where it is, and the, your, your people need to know exactly where it is as well. Water management is a big one. Stormwater and water usage, runoff control, pollution control, your catchment dams, seepage worms, all those sort of things. I'll be looking at that. Uh, fallout dust bucket, just an example. Please make sure that these are in place and are of good quality. I've found that some of the dust buckets are really suspect and you cannot get a, a, an accurate measurement if your dust bucket um, is not in the right place or in good condition. Waste management, general waste, hazardous waste, old oil, rubber, litter, etc. That's all important and, and we, we were looking for uh, creative ideas and legal, they must all be legal. Dust control and monitoring. This came from the um, chief inspector as well, the silica content. Uh, the, the, the 2024 um, milestones, which are low, it's 0 0.05 milligrams per cube. If you've got silica, you're going to have to really be sharp to get to keep within those. In the noise control and monitoring, your surveys. Uh, blasting operations, controlling of monit uh, and monitoring, seismic monitoring, fly rock, vibration damage. This feeds into your community relations as well as your health and safety. Uh, stakeholders, community and neighbours, uh, those important alien vegetation, satellite industries we've spoken about, and then the management and resolution of complaints. That is a, it's a critical part of what, what needs to be done. Some of the complaints we that Sparsa have received, these are just a, a survey, 11% is dust, 18% is noise and vibrations, 22% trucks and truck management. Stephen also, uh, Rudolf also um, alluded to the trucks and truck management. Remember that it is your responsibility what happens off-site as well as on-site in your traffic management. Then the storage, of course, of hazardous material, traffic control and impacts. Again, we come back to that one sensitive ecological areas and correction of gaps identified in previous audits. Um, disposal of waste, end users to certificates. Uh, we found a lot of guys are dumping waste where they shouldn't, so you need to make sure. Remember, it's a cradle to grave principle. You are responsible for what you've created. Um, 
and and you need to to check that the that the people that you are employing to to get rid of this uh, your waste are doing it correctly. Uh, waste management on site. Have you got any recycling projects going, etc. Um, and then the scoring will be will reflect the level of compliance as per the day of the audit. So please don't tell me if this happened a year ago or I did this. That I need to see what is happening on that day. It's like any other inspection or audit. We take a, a, a photo, a snapshot of the day, and uh, you know you, you that's what we look at. Then the scores will definitely uh, or, or can potentially differ significantly from the previous audits because the format and the emphasis has changed. What I have found so far this year is that the online audit, the guys are tending to score a bit lower than the physical audits. Uh, we're not comparing the two. It's the two, says, uh, two separate uh, categories. But the, the online audit for the people that are going to be doing it is not an easy audit. So please make sure that you put the, the you know, get your, your things in place. We're emphasizing, and, and the emphasis is on achieving compliance, not so much on the type of score that you get. So please make use of the audit to achieve compliance. And uh, you use your existing about face files. A lot of the information is in there and uh, the audits are there to assist you and your teams to achieve environmental compliance. So folks, that's, that's basically what I have on that. If you have any questions, you are very welcome to contact me. Um, you can either send me an email or give me a call. Uh, if you need my numbers, uh, Anika has got them. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we, I'll be very happy to, um, to, to assist you. Uh, that's my, my story, Mangoba. Thank you so much, Anthony, um, uh, for that. I think, I believe everyone has seen and understand what's the expectation, especially those who haven't um, been audited yet. Um, I think this is an advantage for us uh, to, 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 to re-look at what will be the expectation from the auditor. Um, any questions from, from you guys? If no question, if you have any question, you can also um, um, type it on the on the on the on the chat, and we'll read it after the session. Um, Mangoma, just, just one thing. Any if, more sorry, sorry, can I just do one one quick one? Uh, the guys must look at. Yeah. I, I sent to everybody. I send out uh, the, the 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 guidelines. So if you follow those guidelines, you really not not going to have a problem with your audits. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you for that comment. Um, I think we can move on to Perry. I see him. I think he is still online. Um, Perry, you can take over. Uh, yes, good morning, Chair, and, and thanks very much. Can everybody hear me clearly? Very clear. Good. Let's just see if we can get that. Right, is the presentation up and ready? You guys can see that? Yes, you can just put it on the presentation. OK, yeah, it's perfect. OK, excellent. Um, folks, my presentation is not really long. Um, it really is the third audit um, proposal that sits with Esparza. There are two mandatory ones. That's the health and safety and the environmental audits. This one is more on, on production and what I would refer to as bottom line. So it's more the, the rands and cents side of things. Um, and often because it's not legislated, it's something that doesn't really sort of get too much attention. So let me have a look at the, the three aspects that I'd like to cover on that. There's obviously the independent audit that we, we're having a look at. Um, there is a quick uh, punt on the videos that we've got for the test methods for on-site training, and then also um, the process for on-site um, beaming competent of your personnel, which would form to a certain degree part of what you've got within your audits. All of them are around the quality of what you do within the laboratory. And it's mainly there just to assist you to make good management decisions on the products that you're actually producing. With regards to the technical audit, it's based on the ISO 17025 principles um, or framework. In other words, it is basically the same as what you've got for ISO 9001. The only difference is it's specifically focused 
on the technical aspects that you'd have within your laboratories. The items that we have a look at would be the personal certification. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit further uh, later on on either 17024. Um, and that is just to ensure that the person will understand the test methods they need to undertake. They're up to date with the revisions of those particular test methods and they're conducting the test methods correctly. The second aspect that is looked at, which is over above the normal 9001, would be the calibration of your equipment and the verification of that. So that is some form of, of check that is done to make sure that the testing is done by the apparatus correctly and that you check those calibrations in place over a regular period of time. The last thing is the participation in interlaboratory comparisons. Now, there are a number of ways of doing it, depending on whether you're a small organization or a large organization. Um, and that is really just taking a sample, splitting it between a number of uh, facilities and getting it tested to make sure that the results that you're getting is comparable with what other folk are getting as well. And it's a good idea to also do that testing with outside facilities. And when I talk about outside facilities, I'm talking about facilities that are commercial in their testing ability and that they are accredited under ISO 17025. And that gives you a leg up in the case where there's a dispute over test results, where you can actually say as long as you're within the mean of the results that are done with the ILC and you can compare that back to a national um, PT scheme, you can at least say that the results that you're producing within your laboratory are at least comparable to what is being obtained by the commercial facilities that are accredited. Obviously, as with 9001, there is the system that is in place where there's the collection of the evidence, the testing records, the evidence of your personal certification, the evidence of your calibration verification of your testing equipment, and then the results that you've got from your interlab comparisons. The Audits themselves are based on the same concept as what you got with the health and safety environmental audits, both in their method or with their methodology and in the costing. So I would be out there for a period of half a day to maybe a full day for the first couple of audits to get you guys orientated with regards to what is required. And over and above that, what I provide during those audits is also input on changes that are happening with regards to the specifications the change from Colto to Koto, the change from TMH1 to uh, SANS 3001, the change that has happened with regards to the old TMH5 sampling methods and the revised TMH sampling methods that now lie under Sabita, um, under the Sabita website, and any other relevant changes that are on the go so that you guys are abreast of what's actually happening in the industry with regards to testing. The basic idea is not to be there as an auditor that is going to whack you over the hands or the knuckles at, at the point where you found to have something wrong. It's really a, a guiding process to ensure that you are producing good quality laboratory results that you can actually base your management decisions on. It's an abridged version of 17025. I'm not expecting particularly the smaller facilities to go the whole hog of getting accredited under 17025 because that could be quite onerous from a costing and paperwork perspective. But maybe for the larger facilities um, the, or the larger organizations, the AFRIMATS, the AFRISANS, um, and possibly Romix, and that I think yeah, Lafarge as well would, would fall under that category, is to look at maybe some of your larger regional facilities becoming accredited and then doing some form of internal testing um, with your other facilities that lie within those various regions. But that is something that I would discuss with those organizations individually, that they can actually look at a process that will work for them and ensure that they're actually ensuring that the, the other facilities that they've got that are maybe more far-flung are still conforming to acceptable quality standards. The benefits. Um, obviously, it is looking at improving the quality of the testing within those laboratories, obviously also improving the experience of the personnel and their knowledge on the testing, and then the result and improved confidence in your results allowing for better management decisions to be made on the quality of the product that is being produced and sold. Remember, the main idea that, that this is look, looking at is obviously quality-based. It's also technically quality-based, but it's also something that can be used to market and improve the quality of how 
the Esparza members are viewed by their partners. So if they're seen to be participating in ILCs that are traceable back to a national standard that is done by the National Laboratory Association, the, the confidence in that particular facility of providing results and products that are acceptable are that much higher. It's not going to be a quick fix. It's something that's going to take a period of time to actually get in place. Um, if we're running these audits once a year, you've got a 12-monthly process by which you need to obviously look at what was raised under the first audit and then actually put things in place to actually correct that for the second audit. But that will be 12 months down the line. If I look at some of the larger facilities, the Aframax, Aframax, the Farges and Romexes, it's unlikely that I will get to them every single year. And it's possible, possible that I would be seeing those facilities maybe once every two years or maybe even once every three years. But as long as there is a system in place by which these can be looked at, um, I think the, the, the benefit to the organizations in cost savings would actually be quite substantial. The idea would be obviously it's going to be incremental. The scores should improve as the years go on. Um, and the quality will grow, the, the quarries would tend to then grow and, and develop in their knowledge of what's required within the system and actually make the correct um, changes so that the laboratory functions correctly. The main aim is to create professional facilities whose results are valid and on which good management decisions can be made and also the related cost savings that can be obtained through these in, in reducing rejected material from your various facilities. So in that regard, on the audits, I'd be really happy to, to get in on board with you guys and start actually helping you guys out, um, improving the overall quality of what you're providing from your laboratory, your, your laboratory testing facilities on the sites themselves. And just remember as well that in most cases, granular and aggregates is what would be looked at, or soils and gravels, the crushed materials. But also on those facilities, you've normally got a concrete uh, lab as well. And the idea would be is to run the audit on both that concrete facility and the granular and aggregate. So we're actually covering two organizations as such in one audit. So feel, feel free to contact me. My email number, my email uh, address and uh, contact number is there. Um, when I'm in that vicinity that I know there are a couple of quarries when I move up into the more far flung regions, um, I will contact you uh, timelessly to see if we can actually arrange uh, an order to take place. With regards to the videos, there are now online videos available um, for training on site without having to have a person physically there. Obviously, it doesn't cover the whole requirement of what is required of training because you would also need somebody to physically watch what the person is doing in the facility and also check the apparatus to make sure that what the person is doing is providing an acceptable result. So there will still need to be some form of, of practical assessment of the individual's capability after they've watched the video and put that into practice. Um, once they've actually had the video, they've had a, somebody's watched the fact that they are now doing the test method correctly. In other words, they've implemented what they've seen. You can actually then request to go and do certification for the deeming competent under the 1704 process, which I'll speak about next. All the basic methods are in there for the GR series, which is the granular series, AG for aggregates, and the CO for concrete. Um, on the aggregate gradings, uh, flakiness, ALD, and ACD and 10% fact are covered. On the granulars, we've got the gradings, the PIs, and the MDDs and CDRs. Um, inside that, we've also got your 20, which is your moisture determination. And then on the concrete, you've got the slump, the tube manufacturing, the curing, and the crushing process. So everything that you need is available for subscription online, which you can actually subscribe for, which I'll give you the prices, I think, on the next slide that's coming up. Um, these videos are more than adequate for the requirements of the Esparza members. We are also looking at doing the GR2, which is the dry grading, which is the production grading that you would use on a more regular basis to check what you are producing. And then to just work out what the difference is between your dry gradings and your wash gradings, so that your results can then compare back to what the commercial facilities will be checking for, for the, the more accurate grading. But for the production side, yes, we will add that additional video in on GR2. And you would then be 
automatically subscribe for that the moment that video becomes available. So when you log on the next time, you will see what happens um, with that particular video becoming available. The other thing, or well, the beauty of these videos as well, is should there be a change in the method that's published through SABS, we will video shoot the new aspects of it. We will add that into the online video. We will remove the old portions. So when you next log on and watch that particular video, it'll actually highlight the fact that the, the method has changed and also highlight those aspects that have changed plus the fact that you would need to then purchase uh, the revised method. You can check these videos out on uh, www.bassoproductions.co.za um, or give me a shout and I'll be able to help you out. Um, if you look at the total package for all the methods, that's granular aggregates and concrete, it is a subscription fee of 15500 per site per year, excluding that, um, which is just over a thousand bucks a month for all the videos that you require. If you're looking at just the aggregates or the concrete, there's a little bit of a surcharge involved in that. But again, um, I think well worthwhile to have a look at those as, as an option to ensure that the staff have an opportunity to watch what's going on. You bring in a new staff member, they can watch the videos before they, staff, before they start. Um, you go on the Easter weekend, you come back, you might have forgotten a couple of things that you need to, go back and just refresh yourself. Um, and then again, when you come back at the beginning of the new year, you've been on leave for a while just to bring yourself in line with what's going on and any changes that might have happened, a quick watch of those videos brings you in line with what's actually required. The last point is on the deeming competent of staff. That is a process that's been put in place through the National Laboratory Association under ISO 17024. So it's exactly the same as what we've got um, for ISO 17025. There's a framework and structure in place, and we will ensure that the folk um, get the required aspects in place. The test methods that we have a look at would be sampling of stockpiles and conveyor belts, riffling, quartering, and coning, server analysis, flakiness, and ALD, loose and compacted bulk densities, which is still in the TMH format, and then ACV and 10% fat. On the granular side, it would be stockpiling and untreated granular layers, riffling, quartering, and coning is repeated there. Your sieve analysis and PR5 for your grading modulus and, and finest modulus. Atterberg limits and then your moisture determination on GR20 as well. Those that are highlighted in blue and, and, and crossed out are aspects that are not really applicable to the Esparza members. And we would need to do a slight revision to what is required for the folk on the Esparza sites so that they can qualify um, with the, the steaming competent uh, aspect. On the concrete side, sampling of fresh concrete, the slump test, the making and curing of cubes, density determination, and the compressor strength is what is there. Once, once you are ready for that, or you feel you are ready, you can register with the NLA, you will be witnessed at an independent site, um, which is not a commercial facility, it won't be at your own facility, um, and there will be independent evaluators that will actually check that you conform to the requirements of the deeming competent under 17024. The relatively long slides, so I'm not going to go through the whole detail of it. It will be available for you to actually have a look at. Um, it's a very structured approach. It ensures that everybody who qualifies for either aggregates or granular or concrete have got the same level of competency across the country. Um, and it would make no difference as to whether you were working at a spa or working in a commercial facility or a secondary supplier, the level of, of understanding of what is required per test method that you are deemed competent on will remain the same so that there is a minimum standard of everything that is being undertaken across the board in that regard. So folks, that's a very brief outline of what we're having a look at. Um, it has been something that has been coming for a while. The, I'm talking particularly now about the audits. Um, and I would really like to get this kickstarted into 2022. I'm speaking to a number of the, the larger organizations as well as some of the smaller facilities that I'm in contact with. And as I move around the country, um, which I do on a regular basis, currently I'm in the Eastern Cape um, around Lady Grey. Um, hopefully I can start getting into these quarries and start giving you the benefit of the audits that you can actually start improving what's, what's going on. There's my cell number down the bottom there. It hasn't changed in a while. 
my email address gets unfortunately a little bit long, um, but by all means, um, give me a shout um, if you are, are desperate to have an audit undertaken. And as I said, I'll throw in all the extra added values uh, with regards to where we act with the Colto and Koto and the revisions on the test methods and any other bit of information that you might need with regards to the training of your staff, etc. So from my side, Chair, thanks very much for the time and the opportunity. Short and sweet, um, and I'll be getting some calls shortly. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Barry, uh, for the presentation. Um, any questions for Barry? Any questions for the previous um, presentations from Anthony? Any questions and comment? I've just went through the the, the chat session uh, site. There's no questions that side. I see. Uh, okay. Uh, Hi right, guys, uh, I would just like to um, highlight that we are also, um, FMS is also an ASPASA associated member. Um, so yes, uh, any questions regarding uh, our assistance would be much appreciated. Thank you so much, um, Jan. Um, if there's no other extra questions, I think we can adjourn the meeting. And uh, thank you for much, so much for your time um, that you've took to dial in. I believe um, the session has been informative. And uh, yeah, we'll take.